Well, you survived. Wasn't too bad, right? How many of you went home and smashed your cell phone? <laughs> I'll have a little bag. I'll have a little bag at the end of the presentations that you're, you can just drop your cell phone in the bag when you leave. I'll take them, good care of them for you. Oh, you don't have any. Are you really not allowed to have any at the school? Yes. Okay, the academy. So I want to ask you, do, do you like that? Yes. Praise God. <laughs> I think you should challenge the adults to go a little while without their cell phone. Shall we do a challenge? See if the adults could put it down for a week. Huh? The adults aren't addicted, are they? I was going to share with you guys uh, uh, another presentation. And um, actually, just after a quite a few conversations with quite a few of you, actually, um, I decided to maybe switch, uh, switch gears a little bit and tell you a little bit of the personal testimony of how I got involved in Hollywood and came out of it. Would that be OK? Yes. Uh, 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 and, and the reason why I want to share that with you um, is because I really feel passionate as the work that you guys are doing and you're going door to door and you're, you're, you're out in the field winning souls. I want you to really consider there is no one too far lost. No one. I mean, literally no one. I wish I had pictures on my computer of, of what I looked like when I was in Hollywood. I, I looked different. I dressed different. I talked different. I, I, I walked different. And if you would have actually come up to me and told me that I would be preaching in your school someday with my Bible, I would have laughed at you and told you you were completely insane. So I, I really want to tell you that think of that when you speak to people that potentially this could be somebody that then goes around and wins a bunch of other souls. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Lord, as we open up this topic, Lord, this isn't my story. This is your story, how you won my heart over. So I just pray that you be with us here in this room. I thank you for each and every young person in this room, any of the older people in this room, anyone that has come here, Lord, I pray that... Um, Something special happened this weekend, and uh, I just pray that over this next week, we go about our daily lives, but with a different mindset, a desire to be connected to you more completely. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. I was a young Seventh-day Adventist boy growing up in a little town called Paradise, and uh, I, was, I come from a very typical um, home. There was two kids in the home. I just had an older brother um, in the very beginning. I'm actually one of four boys right now, but um, in the very beginning, it was just my older brother and I. And um, my parents were, so to say, conservative. They didn't let me watch TV. Um, in fact, um, the, uh, the, the only exposure that I ever really did get to TV was uh, actually going over to my neighborhood friends' house and watching something that, 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 that they um, had on their TVs. That was really the only exposure as a really young child. Um, I can remember my parents actually going to the movie theater, or uh, the movie store, and renting a movie way back when there was VCRs. And we didn't even have a VCR, so they had to rent the VCR as well at the video store. And um, I can remember uh, one of the, the, the first... Um, videos that my parents brought home was Top Gun. I was in the third grade. I know, not a, not a, sh not a video you'd want to show your third grader. But I don't know why my parents saw that. Of course, they fast-forwarded through a, a few of the scenes. But that was a very strange experience as a kid because it was very unusual for my parents. And then I remember one time my dad had to go away on a trip, and my mom came home with a Star Wars series. And I remember she sat down and showed us young kids the Star Wars series and said, this is just like God, this is just like Satan. And um, I mean, it was very impactful to me. I can still remember my, my, my parents making all these equations. 
And my older brother and I, we were very interested in filmmaking because my dad had an eight millimeter film camera. Those of you in the, in the older generation, do you guys remember those eight millimeter film cameras? And my dad used to give my brother and I this film camera and he would buy us all this film and we would get together our friends and we would write tree fort stories. I have a ton of like real Lego movies that I was watching. I made the first original Lego movie, <laughs> made nothing off of it. <laughs> and um, my brother and I were very fascinated with this and when we got to about uh, high school age, our fascination with making films grew with us. And my brother was really big into like getting all the high school kids involved in his like summer making film projects. And one year he decided um, he wanted to blow up a car because that's what all great movies do, right? They burn stuff, break stuff, blow it up. So he went to the, um, the little local fire department and he went to the front desk and he said, um, I'm making a movie and I want to uh, catch a car on fire. Can I buy a permit for this? They were smart enough to ask the fire department for a permit. Well, the lady behind the front desk was kind of confused. Well, I don't know if we have a permit for that. And so she said, well, I'll give you a permit to burn some leaves, and I'll just write on there that you're going to burn a car. And so my brother and his friend took this thing. They took a car way out into the middle of a field. It was a beautiful summer day, absolutely blue sky, not a cloud in the air. And they rig it with all these explosives. I won't tell you how they did it, but I think there was some gasoline and some other stuff involved. And um, they got their like couple little buckets of water to put out the fire after, after they were done filming. And they're out in the middle of this field. And all of a sudden they're like, okay, camera's rolling. They had a bunch of cameras on the scene and they go three, two, one, action. And they blow up this car, boom. It's this huge plume of smoke that goes up in the air. And uh, they take their three buckets of water and throw it on the car and pretty much nothing happens. It keeps burning and this big smoke plume goes up into the air. Well, sure enough, you could see the fire trucks coming down the hill. They kept the cameras rolling the whole time. And the fire trucks come up, and apparently you can't just spray water on a car that's burning. You have to spray a special type of foam. And apparently this special type of foam is very expensive. So the fire chief was pretty upset that they were burning this car, and they had all these cameras out there, and of course he could see what was going on. So after the thing settled down, they got the fire out, he turned around and he said, who's responsible for this? I need to, to, to give them the bill. Apparently it's very expensive for a fire truck to come out to your house. And, um, but my brother pulled out this permit and he said, hey, I got a permit, it says right here. And believe it or not, they took him to court and he actually got out of it. No, no, don't try that at home. <laughs> Those of you that are filmmakers. But our love for filmmaking didn't stop there. Um, when I got to college, I, I went to one of our Adventist schools and I didn't know what I wanted to do in life. Um, I wasn't sure what I, what, what, what I was interested in. And they have a career day when you show up to the college. They have all these booths in the gym and you can like go and visit them all and figure out what you're doing. And so when I went to, when, when I went to the college, um, somebody had told me that Harrison Ford's brother was gonna be a teacher at the film school that they were starting up at the school. And I was like, what, Harrison Ford's brother? No way, it's like a famous dude. I like movies, I'm gonna sign up for that. And so I signed up for that, and um, I can remember um, meeting uh, Harrison Ford's brother. He kind of looked like Harrison Ford. It was very strange. And of course, everybody wanted to like, you know, talk about his brother, and he was like, right off the bat, don't mention anything about my brother. <laughs> and uh, so we didn't ask him too many questions after the first day, and, uh, but he took us out to George Lucas's studios. We got to watch some real movies being made, and that just bit me. I literally was like, oh, I want to do this for a living. Now keep in mind, I was a very good kid. I wasn't like a, like a, like a rebellious kid in the sense that um, you know, I was doing all these evil, evil things. I would go to church, I would be involved in that kind of a thing. But when I went to college and I was starting to want to be in the film industry, I would go to the movie store and I would rent stacks of movies and every single weekend, that's all I did, consume movies, because I was watching, how are they making this movie? What does the lighting look like? What does the acting look like? And I was paying attention to every technical detail of these films. On the weekends, I would go to the theater, and I would see all the latest and greatest movies that would come out, and I would jump. I would hop from movie to movie to movie. It was very not uncommon that I would watch three movies in one night, because I just consumed as much as I could. And Harrison Ford's brother, he kept telling us, you know what, you're not going to make movies about Jesus and 
you know, you can't really make money being a Christian filmmaker, so if you really want to take it serious, you have to go to Hollywood, you have to engage, and you're going to start at the bottom. Nobody's heard of your little liberal arts college, your little Adventist college. You're going to start at the bottom. And so I was looking at my school bill rack up, and I said, well, if it doesn't matter where I go, and I go to Hollywood, then, then um, why am I paying all this money? And so I pulled out at age 19 years old, and I moved down to Southern California. I went and stayed with a friend of mine. She's an actress, still is an actress today. She's been in quite a few movies, quite a few big movies. And um, when I stayed with her, um, I saw the way that people treated her. And I was like, oh, I want to be an actor. Like, that just looks fun. People really respect these people. So I got an agent. I signed up for acting classes, and I went auditioning all the time. And within a short amount of time of me moving to Hollywood, I was a good kid. Remember, I was from this very conservative home. I went to church all the time. I was actively involved in youth groups. I read the spirit of prophecy. I knew what the truth was. But I started going to, to little parties here and there. Somehow, I ended up at one of Britney Spears' birthday parties. Don't know how, I, uh, how we got into this whole situation. And... There was celebrities everywhere, and everyone's doing drugs. Everyone's partying. And I said, you know what? If this is the life that I'm going to be engaged in, and this is what everybody does, why not? Why not engage in this? And that night, I did drugs for the first time, and my life spun out of control. It was this party, that party. I don't even remember. My life was an absolute blur. And, and I had a friend of mine who was also an actor. He was starting to make it pretty famous. Um, he, was, he was starting to book movies. He had a really nice place in Beverly Hills. Um, he hung out with, with a lot of high-profile celebrities. And he started, like, really just, just landing roles. And um, I hung out with him. And he seemed like he was totally happy on the up and up. And two days later, he hung himself in his apartment. And it just shook me to my core. Because here I was, this kid from Northern California, I had all this religious information in my head, and my friend kept telling me, I'm looking into the Buddhist faith. Like, I, I really think there's something there. And guess what I did? I said nothing. I told him nothing about what I believe. I told him nothing about what I knew. I told him nothing at all. And I was kicking myself that, you know what? I closed my mouth. I hid my light under a bushel. People always ask, why did you call your, your, your ministry Little Light? Do you want to really know the reason why? Is because when I was in Hollywood, I ran into so many people, and I said nothing about my religious understanding. And I promised God when I came back into this, into this ministry, I said, I will never hide my light under a bushel ever again. And that's why our name is Little Light. Brothers and sisters, it shook me to my core, but I still continued in that lifestyle. I got out of control with the drinking. I got out of control with the drugs. And I, I continued to try to go on, on auditions. And let me tell you, I was literally the worst actor ever. I couldn't book anything. I did barely anything at all. And so I was frustrated with it. And my older brother, who was one grade ahead of me in school, he um, had come down to Hollywood and he started working in television, actually re rel relatively very quickly. So I called my brother up and I said, I'm sick and tired of this camera life. Everybody's selfish. They're all following around with pictures of themselves saying, pick me, pick me. And it's just like a selfish lifestyle. I don't want it anymore. Can you get me a job in television? And so my brother got me this job um, right away, working for a company that did a television show called The Biggest Loser. I don't know if you've heard of this show. So I worked on season two, three, four, five, six, and I worked in a lot in reality television. And um, I wanted really a good, happy life. I wanted to be happy. But I found that the same thing existed behind the scenes. People were partying just the same as people in front of the scenes. And I couldn't get away from that lifestyle. I lived this way almost for about 10 years, and my brother's 10-year high school reunion came up. And he begged me to come back up to Northern California with him. And I said, man, I'm not friends with any of your friends. Why would I go to, to Paradise Adventist School and, and, and go to that reunion? And he said, please, come on, we'll make it a brotherly trip. I said, okay, fine, I'll go with you. 
So I jumped in the car with my brother. We drove the, the 10 hours up to Northern California. And as we were driving up, it was like all these memories started flooding back into my mind. Man, I remember, you know, going to church and I remember like school and I remember like sitting in seats like you guys in religious meetings and things. And it's like, how did I get so far away from this? And I got all the way up to the school. We pulled into the school parking lot and all of a sudden all these family friends jumped out of the car like next to us as they were parking as well and they were like oh, Tommy Scotty how are you guys doing oh my goodness like like how's Hollywood you know like what movies have you been on what celebrities have you have you um, met have you gone to any like fun like places down there with with any famous people or anything like this and all anybody wanted to talk about was celebrity this celebrity that and so we when we went inside um, we had lunch uh, right after the church service and all these people were kind of crowding around my brother and I and asking us, you know, like what we were all up to. And there was this one kid that was watching this experience happen. And he's kind of like standing there listening to the conversation that people are talking about. And when they kind of left, he walked up and he said, hey, Tommy and Scotty, I have a question for you. How's your relationship with Jesus? And this kid was a pastor's kid. He was the first one to do drugs, first one to get kicked out of school. He was an absolute mess. And he's sitting here asking me with a Bible in his hand, how's your relationship with Christ? And I was like, you got to be kidding me. You got to be kidding. You? Come on. And he said, why don't you come over to my house? I want to share with you what Jesus has done in my life. I'll tell you what, man. I was intrigued. When you see someone's life truly transformed, there's something special about that. So I went over to his house that, that afternoon, and I can remember, he was sitting there opening up his Bible. He's reading scriptures to us. It had been a long time since, I'd, since I had like, read some scriptures. And I was listening to him, and he was talking about the moment that God flipped him around and how his life's been transformed and what he's been up to and all this, right? And at, it was starting to get dusk. It was only myself, him, and my brother brought his boxer dog. So there's the three of us in the room. And all of a sudden, he says, hey, Tommy and Scotty, can I pray with you? I said, sure, you know, we, I grew up praying, let's do it. So as we gathered together to pray, the boxer dog literally backed up against us and the hair went up on the back of its neck. And it went, rawr, 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 and just started barking in the air, like it was trying to attack something. And we were like, that's strange, why is the dog barking? Like it's, it's, you know, there's no one else in here. We thought, maybe there's an animal outside, it got spooked or something and it's protecting us. And so... We quieted the dog down. We gathered together to pray. We were about ready to bow our heads. And on the table, the kitchen table, there was sitting a nutcracker, like one of those Christmas nutcrackers, sitting on the table like this. And we were all about oh, this far away from it. And we're bowing our heads like this. And the hat of the nutcracker came off of the nutcracker and flew across and smashed on the wall. And I'll tell you immediately, the hair went up on the back of my neck. And I said, whoa, 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 stop, 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 stop. It was like everything I'd ever grown up, read, taught, everything just went like this, boom. And I went, what am I doing? What am I doing? I'm this kid from Paradise, California. I was totally, fully aware in, of the understanding of the great controversy. I'm totally in the belly of the beast, in the center of Hollywood, totally surrounded by people who have no idea or don't care about God. I'm totally on drugs. What am I doing? And it freaked me out. I made my brother drive me to the Sacramento airport the next morning. I literally did not sleep that night. And I kept going home, and I was driving around Los Angeles, and I kept like just looking at people like, do you know what's going on? Do you know what's going on? Like, how did I get here? It wasn't like one day, all of a sudden, I woke up and I said, yeah, I don't want God anymore. It was one little step, one little step, one little step, one little step until I walked so far away from God that when I got out into the ocean and I looked back, it was miles deep. And I went, I'm lost. So I started praying a very important prayer. God, I know you're real. There was no question in my mind. I never questioned God. I always knew he was real. I just had no application for him in my life. I said, I know, if I know you're real, show me. You ever prayed that prayer? Show me who you are, God. And let me tell you, my God showed up big time. He was like, oh, yeah? You want to see who I am? All of a sudden, I said, send me somebody. Give me somebody. 
Give me somebody that, that knows their Bible and can help me back. And all of a sudden, a month later, this kid comes down that, that asked me how my relationship was from paradise. And he comes down with two suitcases. I told him, you can come and live on my couch if you want to and come stay with me for a while. And uh, he brought his guitar. He was really good with all the little scripture songs and stuff. And we started having Bible studies. And man, it was awesome. We were like singing. We were like praising God. I was like catching on fire. And all of a sudden, two drug dealers moved into the apartment right below us. And they were like these friendly type of drug dealers. You know, like the ones that just like come over and chat with you. And, you know, they're like really cool. So my friends started going over to their house to witness to them. And he would come back into my apartment and he would say, it was awesome, man. There's a mound of cocaine on the table and I'm sitting there telling him about Jesus. And I'm like, wow, we're going to convert some drug dealers. Like, this is cool. And then my friends started coming home later and later at night. And then before I know it, the drugs were back into my home and I was doing drugs and trying to read the Bible. And let me tell you, things in the Bible are spiritually discerned. You cannot be intoxicated in the mind and understand what the Bible is trying to say because it's the Holy Spirit that is impressing upon us. So I thought I was understanding, but I was not understanding. I was losing my grip on God, and I knew it. And so I prayed that prayer. I said, God, I'm losing my grip on you. Please save me. I'm sinking. And so you know what he did? He sent me an angel in the form of a woman. There was a friend of mine that was going to Loma Linda University, and she came out to visit this friend. We all were from Paradise. We all knew each other. And, uh, and uh, I started dating this girl and really falling in love with her. And uh, I started driving out to Loma Linda and having this relationship with her. But you know what I was doing? I was one foot in the world and one foot in the church. I would go out to Loma Linda, and I'd be this good little Adventist boy singing hymns in church and, 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 and eating veggie food. Then I would go back out to Hollywood, and I would party like a rock star, party like a rock star. Then I would go out, and I would be a good little Adventist. Then I would party like a rock star. And I had so many experiences like that where I finally said, God, I don't want these drugs anymore. I know you can change me. I know you can take it away from me. And I said, I need you right now to give me the strength to get these out of my life. And I jumped in my car. I drove two and a half hours out to, to uh, my girlfriend's house at the time in Loma Linda, knocked on her door at six o'clock in the morning. Her eyes were as big as saucers. What are you doing? And I sat her down and I said, I have to tell you the truth. I'm addicted to this and this and this and this and this, and I've been doing this and this and this behind your back. And you know what? I was prepared for her to say, I don't want you, I'm done, but praise God, she stayed with me, and she is my wife today, and, and I'll tell you what, I am, I've been sober since that day. Brothers and sisters, there's nothing that you struggle with that God cannot take away, nothing. So then you know what was, was, was really interesting? So I remember I was really like, you know, on fire for God again, really getting my life back together. And I was starting to pray and I said, God, I want to do something for you. Please let me in this war. Let me, I'll do whatever you want me to do. What do you want me to do? I'll move if you want me to move. I'll do whatever you want me to do. And when you pray that prayer to God, be careful because he's going to fill your time. <laughs> and all of a sudden my phone rang and that's when this youth pastor asked me to come and give a youth talk about Hollywood. And that's where this whole thing began. And so I, I, I went out preaching in churches, never thought I would ever turn it into a ministry, never thought I would be a, a speaker. That was the furthest thing from my mind. And you know what? I spoke at SoCal Camp Meeting. And do you guys know who um, Janet and, and Jerry Page are? Okay, so Janet Page, when they were the Central California Conference president, they were in prayer groups with my grandmother, my father's mother. And I can remember Janet, when they asked us to speak at SoCal Camp Meeting, came back stage, and she just was sitting there going, this is the most amazing thing I think I've ever seen. I watched your grandmother pray for you for 10 years. I heard all the stories about you kids going to Hollywood. I knew exactly what you guys were doing. And here you're about ready to go out stage and preach a message. Praise God. And like, literally... I tell you that because, listen, how many of you have family members, friends that are not in the church, right? I'm only here.
because my friend chose to open his mouth to me. Open your mouth to your friends. Check in with them. You haven't seen them in a long time. Hey, how's it going? A simple question, how's your relationship with Christ, can actually revolutionize someone's life. And I'm here today as walking proof of that. I wanted to leave a little bit of time as well open for some question and answer for any of the material that was presented over the, the weekend. Is there anyone in the room that has any questions? All right, you got a mic? Okay. Um, so the friend who asked you that question, he's back, is he back in the church? No, ma'am. Unfortunately not. I lost track of him. Do you guys remember when, uh, okay, so did you have, you had a guy named Corey here last weekend? Okay, so Corey works with my brother Brock, and they have that international rescue team that goes and does all that rescue stuff. And when Haiti happened, that was one of their first trips that they went on. I don't know if Corey talked about that. Um, I sent this kid to go on that mission trip when my brother went, because I knew he was struggling, and I knew, I said, what's the best way to get him involved uh, back in the church is to get him involved in, in God's work, right? So I sent him with some video cameras. I sent him down there. He ended up going down to Haiti. He ended up smoking weed, getting in fights, and going to bars. And literally, when I came back and I saw the, or uh, he came back and I saw the footage, he videoed himself taking shots in bars with Haitians. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. You literally have to be kidding me. Like, here's somebody who knows the present truth. I mean, I saw this guy go bold for God. And it's like, why would you do that? And so I said, listen, there's a few things that I need to tell you when you work for a ministry that you can't do. You can't smoke weed, you can't drink, and you can't fight people. <laughs> like, common sense. And he got so upset at me. He said, I'll tell you what, if I see you again, I'll kill you. So I said, okay, I love you, and I will always love you, but have it your way. I lost track of him like for years. And um, I was preaching in Northern California in Oroville, and uh, his parents were there. And I was like, whoa, his parents are here. Like, this is awesome. And then he walked in, and he sat down, and he listened to the whole presentation and the whole sermon. And afterwards, I went over and I spoke with him, and I said, man, how are you doing? He said, dude, pray for me. He said, I ended up in a crack house. I ended up doing crystal meth. I ended up in jail. I, I, I got arrested, and man, my life is not good. I heard recently, I just ran into his cousin a few weeks ago, I just heard that he just got out of rehab in San Francisco. He came in and out of the world so many times, and let this, let this be a caution to you. When you step on Satan's ground, and then you go back to God's ground, and then you go back to Satan's ground, and then you go back to God's ground, every single time you do that, you make it harder and harder. The devil sinks his talons into you, and many people don't walk away from that. And so I pray for him. I told him if I ever see him, I'll give him a hug. He's in my prayers. But yeah, man, it's, it's a real war, and he's somebody that's, that's gotten caught up in it. Is there any other questions? You want the orange one? Okay, so um, what was the name of the actress that you said you went and stayed with? <laughs> oh, I knew somebody was probably going to ask that. <laughs> Her name is Allison Lohman. She was in Big Fish. She was the little girl that was in Big Fish with Tim Burton. Oh. Um, she's been in quite a few different movies. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. So I've wondered, uh, 
for the videos that you make uh, displaying like what is wrong with the movies and whatnot, do you actually watch the movies to figure out what's wrong or how, to, how do you do that? That is such an excellent question and I'm glad that you asked that because it needs to be understood. No, I don't watch them. And there's a reason why. When I first started this ministry, I said, I, I was in love with movies. I mean, that was my addiction, right? I watched everything, didn't matter what the rating was. And so I was like, cool, a ministry where I get to just watch movies and point out what's wrong with it. That's awesome, right? And then the more that I watched the movies, the less I could point it out. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't see it, and it wasn't sensitive to it. And so it scared me, and I went, whoa, 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 whoa. If I watch them, I don't see anything wrong with them. And then it was like, okay, God, I don't want to watch them. And literally, I haven't watched them, so I read about them. So when we did a presentation on the Marvel movies, I think maybe I saw Iron Man 1 way back when it was first made. Never seen any other ones. Mm -hmm. I don't watch them. You you mentioned something about it was an addiction for you. So how did you get away from that? S especially, well, I don't know if back when you were dealing with this whole thing, it was very easy to access them. But especially nowadays, you have so many like hubs where you can just go and... For free. Exactly. Yeah, Hulu. Yeah. You can watch this for free. Exactly. Why would they do that? <laughs> <laughs> so, so how did you get away from that? You are asking another excellent question. I learned something very early on in my walk with Christ, coming back into the church. Um, and this, this was the case with, with anything. You can apply this to anything. So I'm just going to talk about movies, but you can apply it to, um, you know, a sexual addiction or anything else, right? Um, I, I, I said, Lord, if you give me the choice, I'm going to come home and I'm going to watch these movies because I like them. That's my, ch that's my desire playing out. But if you don't want me to watch them, Lord, I give you permission to change my heart. That's what I said. That's all I said. I said, God, change my tastes. And I equate it like this. I used to love white pancakes, like buttermilk pancakes. You, know, you guys ever had those? Those things were awesome. And I remember when I first got married, my wife was like, uh-uh, it's going to be whole wheat and buckwheat. And I was like, oh, man. It's like eating a brick. <laughs> Can I tell you today, I absolutely love whole wheat pancakes. I would prefer the more hearty they are. I love them. <laughs> and it, I, I don't like white pancakes anymore. And why? Because I changed my taste buds. And now my taste buds desire this over here. And so that's what I prayed to God. I said, God, you've got to change my taste buds. And I give you permission. You have full reign, full permission. Here is my heart. Take it and do what you want with it. That's literally what I did to God. And you know what? Slowly but surely, he took it away from me. And before I knew it, I didn't want to watch him. I had no more desire. Now I'm the worst person to watch a movie with ever because I'm like, pause, look, ah, oh, background, look at this, ah. People are like, just, it's a movie, just be quiet. So I, I don't like to watch them because it's a waste of time. I'd rather do something else. I, I get more enjoyment out of a conversation with somebody than I do watching a movie. Any other questions? Um, what would be some advice that you would give to young people for those who are in an environment where they're saturated with present truth and quotes and spirit of prophecy? as youth to maintain that relationship? Because obviously your friend and yourself, you guys had that environment at one point, but it's clear that just because you have that environment doesn't mean you're gonna stay with that. What would you share with us practically? It's so true that train up a child in the ways and, and they will not depart from it, right? It's so true. When you build that foundation, it's in there. But that's still not a 100% a, a guaranteed surety. I think my problem was I intellectually understood a lot about God and about the Bible. I read, I understood, I, I knew the, the, the issues and the doctrines and things like this, but I did not have a heart for God. I was not in love with God. I did not see the value that, um, um, wow, this is really, truly amazing. And I, and I want to be really, really honest with you guys. Because those of you that are going to start family someday, I'm speaking to you guys. And even you guys that are older, the older generation. I love my parents to death. I have a wonderful relationship with my parents today. I went years in my, in my Hollywood experience not talking to my parents. And since I've come back, I've built a beautiful relationship. But I'll be honest about my parents. My parents were all rules and no love. 
And I grew up with a false view of what God was like. It was rules, it was do this, and I did not see the value in my parents that it was enjoyable and it made their life better. I'll guarantee you, you older folks, your kids are watching you more than you possibly even would say out of your mouth. That means more to your kids. Them watching you and going, hey, you go to church all the time. Are you guys having fun? Are you guys enjoying it? Do you really believe it? That's what's going on in your child's mind. More than you telling them, you need to revere the Sabbath. You need to do this. And so for me, I did not see that in my parents at that stage. My parents has since totally changed. My dad's a big softy now. But I'll tell you what, when you are a parent, and if and when, you guys need to show your children that your relationship with Christ enriches your life, and that's going to be the best defense against that. So even, even teachers that are in the room, you guys are in the same boat. You are essentially their parents. You need to model it. If you believe this is real and the gospel is working on your heart and it's all about love and it's a book of love, then we better see love pouring out of you. Amen? Amen. That's the biggest speech you're ever going to speak to somebody. And even in your life with your friends, if your friends see that you are genuine and that you are truly, honestly loving, that will speak volumes to them because the world is full of broken roads. Anybody else? Yes, hi. <clears throat> we are living in a society that's saturated with media, and of course, technology is cheap, and anybody and everybody can get involved. Um, so we have a lot of young people, Adventist young people, who are thinking about careers in filming, producing films, writing stories, and so forth. What would you counsel them uh, to help them kind of know whether they're going down a path that God can bless or heading down the wrong path? So another excellent question, and I'll frame it in the context that you asked it with film, but you can apply this literally to whatever career you're into, okay? So it's not specifically just film. When I, when I was growing up, that was my idol. Like, literally, I lived, breathed, slept filmmaking. I wanted to be a filmmaker. That was my passion. So when God really changed my direction, I was like, no, God, don't take this away from me. This is like what I was meant to do and meant to be. But you know what's awesome about our God? He didn't steal it from me and say, you know what? You can't do this anymore. He said, I'm going to trade you. I'm going to give you your, you're still going to do your skills. You're still going to do what you desire. You're going to still make media projects, but you're going to now do it for me. I do what I want to do for God now. So kids that are, that are going there, it's, it's a temptation, I believe, for us to go, I want to do something for God. Now, every Christian filmmaker wants to go to Hollywood and make the great controversy. You go sit down, talk to any of these kids. They're like, I want to, like the Matrix, you know, I could just see the angels like flying by and stuff, you know, <laughs> right? I thought that too. In fact, the first film my brother and I wanted to make when we came out was Samson. I mean, can you imagine? Seven dreads, donkey jawbone taking out a thousand people in slow motion, you know? Be awesome, right? But I literally said, God, what do you want me to do? So this is what I caution with young people. Let's say you want to make the great controversy. You need a couple of million dollars to go and make the great controversy because that's what it's going to take. And you say, hey, God, I need a million, two million dollars to make this. And if you give it to me, I know it's from you. And, and if you don't want me to do this film, then I, I tell you, don't give me the money. Okay? So if you pray that prayer, and all of a sudden the devil's watching and he's going, hmm, interesting. He just prayed a prayer that said he wanted $2 million. So I'm going to give him $2 million so that he thinks it came from God, but it really came from me, and it's going to destroy his life. Who's more powerful, God or the devil? God. So God is obviously 10 billion, trillion, gazillion. It's not even a comparison. So if the devil tries to give you $2 million, you won't be able to cash it. It will be lost, stolen, broken. There will not be money in your mailbox. It will not get to you. Why? Because you put the glory in God's hands, Right? You have every right to go to heaven. If you say, hey, $2 million showed up in my bank, my bank account. Like, God, you gave that money to me. I told you not to give it to me if you don't want me to do this. You have that right to say that to God, but it'll never happen because God's glory is on the line. 
So whatever career you're in, don't go to God or don't go to anybody and say, I'm going to go do this for God. Well, what if God doesn't want you to do it? Go to God with everything. God, is this what you want me to do? Because if you want me to be a filmmaker, God, then open the doors. If you don't, close the doors. And if you try to go to Hollywood and you pray that prayer, you couldn't, you couldn't get into Hollywood if you tried. You would be lost. Your car wouldn't get there. It wouldn't happen because God's glory is on the line. So whatever career choice you, you pick, involve God in that decision. God, is this what you want me to do? And he ultimately will direct your past because that's what he says in his word. Okay. He, um, I have a question here. Uh, what is your ultimate goal in Little Light? My ministry? ultimate goal in Little Light. Our passion is these, these young people. This is our passion. Um, I believe that our church does an excellent job speaking to the elder generation. We've got lots of great ministries. It is written, amazing facts, you name it, right? Uh, sit down and ask these people, how many of you have watched uh, an It Is Written video? Okay, well, maybe this is a bad room. <laughs> and I should be careful. I'm not, I'm not saying that it's just bad. It's just it's catering to a, a different demographic. And so we, we as a church, we speak to the little kids. We have the My Places with Jesus. We have the Discovery Mountain. We have this kind of stuff. But the teenage, who, who's talking to these guys? Where's the people making content for them? And they're dealing with some crazy things. Like, you guys are battling, like, what it means to be human. I mean, that's what people are questioning in the world right now. Our generation is like, what? Like, that just doesn't even make sense. And so our ministry tries to tackle topics that are dealing with them. If you talk to any young person today, they deal with only five things, really. Like, media, movies, video games, relationships, and food or something, <laughs> right? And if you can't find a way to speak Jesus to them, within that context, they're like, uh, I, don't, I don't get it. It's not relevant. You know what I mean? That's the average young person. So we've chosen to pick these very difficult topics and try and teach them our Adventist truths. Our church has been blessed with so many amazing truths. How do we put it in a palatable way and give it to this generation? And we found using media is a good way to do that, but also speaking about topics that they are engaged in or struggling with or need information on. So that's our ultimate goal. We'll keep hammering away at this until I, I get too old and they go, why is the old guy up there? <laughs> or, All right. Okay. So let's say you have like a good group of friends, right? Yes. And so you've been witnessing to them, and they've, they're, they know about the truth, you know, like you said, they know about the Adventist message and everything, but they struggle with movies and different things like that. And even though you told them everything, all the information you know about it, how bad it is, and what it can do to you, and they continue to do it, and they know everything, but they continue to do it, like, what do you do? Do you just give up on them after telling them and telling them and telling them? So, because your life is also sure. on the line. So I'll frame this context in the way of my wife. And I'm going to be very honest. Hopefully she's not watching online right now. <laughs> um, my wife grew up in a home that media was a very big part of their life. And she grew up with a TV on in, 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 in the background. You guys know anybody like this? Like, they just have a TV on. Nobody's watching it. It's like, why is the TV on? Like, that just would drive me up a wall. <laughs> and she grew up on Disney everything, and her parents were, were allowing them to watch things that, that uh, I think are, are, are absolutely terrible things. And so when I got married and we, I started working in this ministry, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of all or nothing. Like, you know what I mean? I'm like full tilt. You're gonna be, we're going to be for God? Let's go for God. We're going to be in the world? Let's go be in the world. Like, like, there's no point in being in both camps, right? And uh, somebody described it today. I think it was, uh, it was Ralph or something. I don't remember. Uh, it said, why be a double loser? And I thought, that, that's brilliant, right? If you're a double loser, you lose out on God, and then you also lose out on the world. You know what I mean? You, you don't get either one of them when you do that kind of thing. And so um, I can remember going out on a presentation in the very beginning of our ministry, and I came home, and my wife was watching American Idol. And I just, oh, just, I was like, how can you be watching this? Like, I'm running around telling people the dangers of media, and I come home, and it's in my own house. I can't get it out of my own house. And I just walked over to the TV. I'm not, I'm not normally a violent person. I walked over to the TV and it was just, literally, I punched the TV just because the TV was my problem. It wasn't my wife. It was just this thing, you know, that I, that I couldn't stand. And then 
I said, God, this isn't my problem. You brought this girl to me. It's your problem. <laughs> you fix it. That's what I said to God. And I walked away and I went into the other room. And I, what I did was I didn't engage in, in TV. When my wife was watching TV, I went into the other room. And uh, oftentimes she would want to just be sitting down and watching something out of boredom and I'd say, hey, let's play Scrabble or hey, let's do something. So I'd constantly in, engage with her, not surrendering, not around the TV. And slowly but surely the TV went off. So you don't give up on them. So you don't give up on them. So I literally prayed for her and said, God, you've got to change your heart. And it wasn't overnight. It took a long time. And it, to me, it was an embarrassment because here I am in this media exposing business <laughs> or in ministry, and yet my wife wouldn't even grab this concept. And I'll tell you what, today, my wife is more conservative than I am with the, with the TV now because she's seen the value of it. She's seen raising the kids without all this, all this stuff and, and whatnot. And, and, and so I've, my friends in Hollywood were the same way. I mean, they, they watched me go from partying to all of a sudden, like, I was passing out Walter Veith videos. Like, dude, you got to check this out, man. This guy's, like, got some underground, underground stuff. And I like this. And um, my friends thought I was crazy, you know? And I, and I kept praying for him and kept praying for him. And, and there is a point when I couldn't engage with some of them anymore because they, were just, they just didn't want to see it. So I think there's a point. Pray for that moment. But yeah, definitely don't give up on them. Pray for them heavier. And then if you're around them and they talk about it, just try and steer the conversation into something else. Or if they want to do it while you're around, say, hey, guys, let's go outside. Let's do something. Let's take a walk. Let's do something. Engage in a different way. Thank you. Is this on? So coming from Hollywood and being familiar with some of the lifestyle and the struggles that they have there, what kind of things would you do or say to reach out to somebody that's still in that? Um, are you speaking of Adventists that have gone there, or are you speaking of secular people that are there? I mean, both. Okay. So I would treat them a little bit um, differently. I mean, I would obviously start blanketing them with prayers. I think everything begins with a relationship. And right off the bat, you have to build their trust, and you have to build, so to say, the right to be able to say something to them if they're your friend. And even if they're not, I mean, sharing just random information with people, somebody knocked on Angus's door, Angus Jones from, or, um, from, from the, the Three and a Half Men, right? And uh, Michael, um, they have a ministry called Can You Hear Me Now? Um, Michael and Denise Johnson. I love those guys. I mean, he, they, so that was somebody randomly knocking on his door. And then he was like, well, like sure, let's have Bible studies. And they, they literally won him over like that. So, you know, I believe that we should have more ministries that reach out to them. Pray for those people. What's going on with all these celebrities trying to, like, come out and be Christian right now? Uh, that's a two-edged sword. I believe it could be totally a, a bad direction. But then also, uh, these are very real people that could be in heaven with us. Pray for them. And so, um, you know, I, I have a lady in Australia that really feels a burden to reach Keanu Reeves. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> she calls me all, you know, emails me from time to time, and she's always like, you know, like, how do I get to Keanu Reeves? Do you know him? Do you know his, 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 um, his manager or anything like that? And I was like, no, sorry, I don't know him. But, yeah, why aren't we praying for these people? Why aren't we trying to reach them? She sent multiple great controversies to his manager saying, please give these to Keanu. I think that's cool. Why, why don't we do more of that? The black one. Oh. OK. So um, coming from Hollywood, we've, well, I've heard that, you know, the enemy is very present on, like, people will actually worship or do stuff to get where they are. So I'm just curious if you as being there, you could see things like... Oh, yes. Like it was something normal? It's something like they hide or like everybody knows? Or it's in the shadows. So it's not, it's not something that you immediately recognize, but judging from this set of eyes that I have now, and I think back on experiences that I experienced, absolutely, I was in the room with them, for sure. And that's why that, that, that experience that happened to me, I guarantee you that demon was with me. I guarantee you he was with me. He wasn't with that kid. 
And, and I bet you the demon realized they're praying, and he was upset. Bam! And he revealed himself. And what he didn't expect, he scared me, but he scared me into it. And I think sometimes that's why we don't see it so out, out in the open. People would just run to God, especially if you've been raised with any sort of Christian understanding. A, a lot of us would. So it's in the shadows. It's behind the scenes. It's, it's behind people. There's a ton of examples of, of actors that, that invite spirits in to help them in their acting, and they talk about it like that. I mean, like the video we saw when, I don't know his name, whatever. Yeah, Denzel he, Washington. Yeah. Yes. So for me, it's very like, it's very, you know, like impacting because you, it's not like you're saying, oh, I will just walk away from God. It's like, I'm going to worship the enemy, you know, That's like right. I'm going right so, into it. So I equate it like this. Um, when you go to church, what are you learning in church? You learn about how to have a relationship, right? This whole book is about how you should dress, how you should interact with your relationships, how you should um, um, treat others. All of those things are things that you learn from sermons. But if you go to church just once, are you going to have an understanding about God? Not at all. You have to go to church over and over and over again. It's about reading. It's about studying. It's about little time here, little time there that builds up this worldview about God, right? Well, did you know that the devil's doing the same thing with the movies? It's no different than church. What is a movie telling you to do? It's telling you how to have a relationship, how you should walk, how you should dress, how you should have all of those things that you literally learn in a sermon, but the opposite end of the spectrum. And so I've begun to look at movies as they're no different than a sermon. That's literally all they are. And so if you think of it like that, then you go, well, what is this teaching me? What am I going to learn from this piece of media? And um, a lot of it, if you analyze it from that perspective, it's just throw it out. So um, I had a friend tell me at one point that uh, it was a person who was like struggling with, you know, movies and whatnot. And so uh, they watched one of your videos. And at the time, I think it was like, uh, anyway, it's a presentation on one of the movies. Um, but they eventually like, you know, they, they started watching more and more videos and they kind of started becoming interested on the movies themselves. So they ended up going and watching them. Yeah. So there is that danger, and you know it's a delicate, delicate balance for us as a ministry because we don't want to expose somebody that's like, it's going to entice them, you know? For me, it was like, I remember when I was weak with drugs, I had to delete everybody in my phone that had anything to do with drugs. I didn't want to see it. I didn't want to be around it. And, um, uh, and I can remember one experience where I actually physically saw it, and it was crazy how it was like, <gasps> like, like drawing to it, just to, just to look at it. And so I can understand that from my own struggle, my own perspective of that. Yeah, if you struggle with movies and you're all of a sudden seeing all these clips and stuff like this, and you're going, man, I kind of want to go watch that and see what they're doing in that. That's why I really honestly believe it's going to boil down to your heart. Do you really want a heart change? And if you do, and you know you struggle in this area, you've got to come to God and you've got to say, God, I have a problem, but I'm going to give you my heart, and I give you permission to change it. If you don't pray that prayer, then cutting all these things off is just literally behavior modification. That's it, right? God doesn't want just behavior modification. He wants your heart. And he wants to change you from the inside out to the point where, like putting a tree of knowledge of evil in a garden, in a perfect environment, he placed a very evil thing. Why? Because he wanted us to be able to come up to the tree and say, you know what? I don't want it. See ya. Even if it's right there, don't want it, don't even need it. We have to get to that level. And so enticing people, if, if, it's, if it's not me, you know what? They're going to they're gonna go into it anyway. You know what I mean? Just shielding them from it. I would say their heart is the biggest issue, and they need to work on that and, and, and attack it from that angle. So would you recommend your ministry mostly to people that are still in that because people that are not in it, they don't necessarily need to know about it? Absolutely. Do you know Scott Ritzema? I've heard of him. So I love Scott Ritzema. We actually sell Scott Ritzema's videos. 
And the reason when Scott Ritzema came out, I remember when he first used to call our ministry way back when, and he was like, man, I want to do this, and I don't want to show all these clips. And we encouraged him, great, do that. And he does that. He doesn't show all of the examples because there's people who don't need to be exposed to these kind of things. And so we always say, hey, well, go watch Scott Ritzema stuff. If you need to know the information without knowing what's really wrong with it or getting into the nitty gritty, then go for it. But there's a whole bunch of people that would never watch Scott Ritzema's stuff that would watch our stuff and vice versa. So I believe that God, the reason why he raised up two ministries that kind of similarly do the same kind of work, but they're just different ways of reaching them. We've had people call our ministry all the time that are not, not even from our church, you know, and they're just like, whoa, what you're presenting, I've never heard that before. What else do you got? What, give me more. And so we can say, hey, check out this ministry. Watch this. Here's a Bible study on this. And we lead people using that as the first capture. I'll tell you what, I, 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 wanna, I, I don't want to take up too much time on this question, but um, I just did a, uh, uh, a YouTube show with a guy who, he was very sweet, and he called our ministry up, and he said, I would like to invite you guys on our show. I'm a huge comic book fan. And so I was like, cool, he's a comic book fan, right? He, 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 that he's immersed in comics. And so when I got on the YouTube show with him, it was a live show, he's wearing a Spider-Man hat and a Batman shirt. And I went, nice God, you got a funny sense of humor. <laughs> and, and I was like, kind of at first I was like, okay, what's my angle, what's my angle? Because I'm gonna try to convince this guy of my way. And so we were kind of going around, and there was a couple of us on the, on the show, and, and he starts um, saying, you know, what, where are you from? How did you get involved in this? So we kind of went through what, why we're involved in what we're doing. So I told him I worked in Hollywood. I came out. I'm doing this, blah, blah, blah. And um, it got to him, and he started talking about his own personal life, and he said, you know, I was bullied in school. I had a stroke when I was two months old, and I lost 90% of the function on my right side. And he pulled his hand out, and he had a withered hand, and he put it back down, so I couldn't see it when we first started the conversation. And he said, kids would beat me up in school. I was thrown out of a two-story building because these kids bullied me so bad. And he said when he was 16 years old, he literally said, I don't want to live life anymore. I want to commit suicide. And you know what saved him? A Spider-Man comic. He read the Spider-Man comic, and he saw Jesus in that comic. Now, immediately, I was like, man, I've done a lot of research on, on, on superheroes. What am I going to say to this guy? And as he kept talking, he said, listen, I love what you guys do. I support what you guys do. But I'll tell you what, there are people that are immersed in this comic book world that would never click on your video. They would never, if they smell that it's religious, they would be done. And he goes, I'm having Bible studies with these comic book fans and showing them this. And I'm not encouraging them to watch it, but I'm using the stories to teach them about Jesus. What am I going to say to that? I was literally like, Lord, rebuke me. What a small mind I have. And I said, this is one of those times when I believe that God calls people to do very special things. It would not be okay for me or to anybody in this room to just say, okay, fine, I'm going to start a comic book ministry and dive straight into it. But because of his circumstances, he's reaching people and pulling them out that would never set foot in a church. And I said, man, you're going to have stars in your crown for that. And, 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 and I said, the only advice that I can give you is make sure you're on your knees asking God, is this what you want me to do? And he said, I absolutely am. I said, brother, I love you, man. I want to encourage you. It's going to sound really weird, and I hope none of my audience is watching this. But I said, I want to encourage you. Keep winning souls. That's the end of the game. Any other questions? I've really appreciated the weekend. It's been a blessing uh, to hear these things and, and hearing you encouraging us to be free Praise God. from things that have really been addictive. Uh, a little disclaimer that our, uh, and I appreciate our academy students, when they come to school, we take their phones. <laughs> they it. don't have them with them. That's one reason for sure they're not being used. Because you don't uh, have one. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so that little disclaimer. That to the side, um, we do have a little oasis from the media things here. But that 
is not an oasis when they go back home or somewhere else when they have their devices again. And I'm, and 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 I don't think uh, I, I wanted any suggestions from you of how we can do things to encourage uh, a, a, a true change of heart toward it when they're it's all in their power, it's all in their hands. So I think part of my work is first awareness. That's why I think Mrs. White told us we should not be ignorant of the devil's devices. If you don't know why or how or what is going on, then it's too easy for him to get you caught up in it. So for me, the first line of defense is to be aware that these devices are addictive. They are, they're designed in the way that they do. I really mean it. You guys, here's a little piece of homework. In your religious class or your, or your Bible class, do some research on this topic social media and the guys that are coming out and saying that it's dangerous. Just type that into the YouTube in, in one of your classes. Is social media dangerous? And look at some of the articles and things that come along. So you gotta get in the habit of doing some research with these things that are involved in your life. Then part number two, you've gotta really pray, God, is this something you want me to be involved in? Part number three, you gotta make a decision. You gotta make a stand. There's a reason why Daniel purposed in his heart with the food in the beginning of Daniel. It was a decision that was made before the test that he purposed in his heart so that when the test came, he wasn't struggling with it. So you've gotta, you, you, you young guys, you gotta go, listen, I need to be responsible with this. And if I'm out of control, then like the Bible says, cut it off, put it away, do something else. One of the guys that worked in our ministry, he had a flip phone for a long time because he's just like, I don't want the temptation. Do that if you have to make a drastic measure like that. And another thing that I learned as a parent, reading child guidance, um, Mrs. White makes a statement that we should, we should ready our children as fast as possible and get them on their feet making decisions underneath our roof. And so if we just take away the media and it's just literally we've made that decision for them. You cannot have this media. We've given them no tools and no responsibility and no way to gauge them own selves. And then they go out into the real world and it's like, good luck, have fun. I guarantee you many of them are going to fall. So it's my job to teach my children how to play responsibly and how to do it. The iPad, you can have these learning tools. You can have word games. You can have things where you can communicate with someone else FaceTime. You can do these things that, that, that are not necessarily evil. And so I've trained my kids. The technology is there. I have some of these devices, but there's safeguards that are put on them. You cannot have this in your room. You cannot play with this at any old time or will. You need to come up to me and ask me. And then you need to show me what you're working on. And so I'm teaching them how to be responsible with the media rather than just bubbling, taking it away from them because they're going to be confronted with it by the time they're 18. And I've seen too many times, I've gone around the world, they go 10 times further into it if they literally just have ne it's like It's like asking a baby to learn how to run a marathon and he's never walked before. So that's, that's the idea. Teach the responsibility learn the information about it, and that's where we need to talk about these issues. Let's talk about them. You guys, there, there should be no reason why we should not be able to, in a church setting, talk about pornography. No reason whatsoever. You read the statistics, I'm, I'm sorry, you play on the internet long enough, you will come across it. It is not if, it is when, literally when. If we're not talking about it, it's just going to grow and fester. See, the devil likes darkness. You shine a light on it. He doesn't like that. So we need to start talking about these issues. They're real issues. We really struggle with them, and they're real. So let's get it out in the open, and let's be the people that God is asking us to be, and we need to talk about these issues. Anyone else? Um, so how do, you, how do you decide what what you're gonna do research on and how do you do that research? Um, it begins with, with a lot of like, you know, sort of just thinking about, okay, what are some of the questions that come in? So I'm, I'm constantly paying attention to what you guys are asking right now. If you guys keep asking the same question and I see, I go around to different churches and the same topics start coming up, then I go, okay, well, we need some information on that and, and I'll, I'll tack it like that. Um, questions that come into the ministry. Anybody in here like anime? used to watch anime, probably don't want to admit that. Anybody watch anime? Right? Okay. 
So this is one of the questions that we get all the time. And I was like, really, anime? Isn't that like kids' cartoons? Like, really? <laughs> but people have a genuine question on that. So what we'll do is when we see enough interest like that, we'll say, okay, God, is this something that you want us to work on? And if it is, send us some people that know, know how to help us put this together. So we're actually putting a project on anime together. What about, like, you know, the whole alien movement? Anybody ever looked into that? Oh, it's nuts. I guarantee you that the devil's going to use the supernatural in his final trick. So we need to be able to, like, really address some of these things. Did you know that our government just came out with a whole um, space alien program? This is not real. Did you know that there is real, real military colonels, lieutenants, we're talking generals that have come out on CNN. You can look on, you can look on, on, on YouTube for this. Generals in our army literally coming out on CNN saying we are in direct communication with aliens. Like this is not a joke. Of course, for us, we know it's just the devil messing with people, but this is how he's going to prepare people. So these kind of topics we listen to, we talk with kids, and we say, okay, how can we give them the proper context of this and frame it within our Adventist doctrines? And that's basically how we come up with projects. So how do you decide like, what movies you're going to cover? Oh, um, well, our original idea with the, the, the LED series that we have on YouTube was to put out videos before the movie comes out so that we could give people information and hopefully deter them from watching it. That was our original intent with that. So most of the stuff we're trying to stay currently available uh, on it so that, so that we can give you guys enough information. If you guys see a pattern over and over and over again, you keep seeing the same thing popping up, eventually, hopefully, we hope many of you guys will be like, you know what, I don't need to watch that. And that's just, that's just darkness and leave it alone. And what about when you're going to explain about it? Um, how do you know what you're going to look for? And um, so, if you if you actually pay attention to our videos, they're really made of trailers. <laughs> they're really like not made of much more than trailers. We're able to see in two minutes what the spiritual warfare is in it, and we'll do a little bit of research. We'll try to see, you know, did the directors comment on this, or did they do anything on this? Um, the, the the topics that we did, like we did one on yoga. So the topic that we did on yoga, in Christian yoga, so to say, did you know that there's a bunch of people that run around and yeah, yeah, it's pretty wild when you see it because it's just, it's it like yoga to a Hindu is like baptism to a Christian. And we have rebranded it and put it in our schools. And many of our Adventist schools, there's, there's Adventist schools that teach yoga in it. Did you, I don't know if you knew that, but. Um, so we decided that's a topic to address. Those take a lot more time and research and actually going to people who, you know, were involved in Eastern mysticism or whatever. So sometimes they take a long time, but the movie thing is usually just a short amount of research. Orange? Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm... Some of you might know my testimony, but basically I used to watch a lot of movies, especially anime, obviously. But not obviously, but a lot of people might not know that. <laughs> yeah, would not have chosen that. <laughs> they probably not have known that. But um, I've been getting out of it, and uh, and it's been a it's been a blessing. Um, but a lot of it, I I love watching YouTube because there's so much information on it. I love history. I love how tos. I love the tinker. I like the sermons. You yeah. know, so many things. But it's so easy to go off track. That's right. When you're on YouTube, That's and so, it. do you have any advice or anything? You know, somebody shared with me tonight that I thought was a really uh, amazing practical advice. Do you know you can shut off all those suggestions? So the only thing that you actually get in your feed would be things that you subscribe to. That's a button. So if you really find yourself having an issue or a problem or grab, deviating from what you're actually trying to go to YouTube for, then you need to take steps like that and protect yourself. So. I, I, I too, I mean, I, I totally have, have done that, you know, where you're waiting for an airplane at an airport and I'm watching a video and I'm trying to like pay attention to one of my ministry colleagues' videos and before I know it, I'm like watching something that like, I'm like, oh, wait, wait, how did I get here? It's totally, totally, I don't, I don't need that junk in my mind. And so YouTube can be a very, very big distraction tool. And they've designed it that way. They, they make lots of money to keep your attention like that. So, um, yeah, you know, it's like anything else. If you find yourself gravitating to it, then you need to stop and say, what's causing me to get here? What would cause me to 
to, to put some safeguards on this. And if I really have a problem with it, I would suggest, you know, either um, um, go to YouTube and you can download. There's a lot of things that give you the little video or the, the softwares that you can download the video. Download them and then watch it. Get off of YouTube so that you're only watching just what you, what you went there for. That's, that would be a piece of suggestion. Anyone else? Good. <laughs> Looks like this is a good time. Then I've been asked, uh, given the privilege actually of, on behalf of the students and the staff here at Washita, we want to thank you so much for coming. Do you Praise God. Just Praise let God. him know. Praise God. Praise God. We've, we've learned a lot. Um, we, we want to cheer you on your ministry as well. We're going to be praying for you so that God will lead you in this delicate work, but very vitally important work that you have. I was especially blessed by the part of his story that you shared tonight, how he reached you in your life, and uh, I'm just praising God for it. So thank you for coming finally. Praise we God. hope you'll come back. <laughs> yes, and, uh, not next weekend, but no. uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, but if you have a free weekend, we'd love to have you back. That'd be awesome. And are you going to be available for uh, people to just talk to you personally or sell Absolutely. some of the videos you have? Absolutely. I only brought a handful of videos, so um, if you are interested in that or you've got people that are really needing to know this information, um, you're welcome to, to take a look at those. It's one of the ways that we do support our ministry. And then also we have, so, we have hundreds of videos on YouTube. So if you're really seeking out this information, um, um, we put it out there for free because we want people to know it. And young people don't buy anything, so that's the only way to get to them. And so, you know, it's, it's one, of the, one of the real big ways for us to, to share information. And I just thank you guys for inviting our ministry. We're there. If you guys want help, communicate with us. If you want us to tackle a topic, we want to hear about it from you. You guys are the ones that are our demographic. And... You guys are also really very helpful to me because if you go door to door and you see the same things popping up, questions, things that people want to know about, let us know about that. Hey, people are really seeking this information and we don't have anything like this. And we will seriously pray about it, customize something, and you know, give you guys something that you could go canvassing on. I don't know. Yeah, I actually thought that somebody was going to ask you uh, or, or that we could have opened it up for anyone here to tell you, hey, could you do a topic on... Da da da, whatever yep. it is. So maybe when you see him out in the hall, if you've got a burden or something, an interest, by all means, let him know. And who knows, but there'll be a video on it. Okay? Well, again, thank you. God You're bless you. Welcome. And let's pray. Let's, let's, pray. let's bow in prayer. Living God, um, how grateful we are that you raise up people from all walks of life, that you, you save us, Lord. You deliver us. What a beautiful story to hear that someone who grew up in, <laughs> of all places, paradise, and, uh, and goes astray, but that you, you bring them back to yourself in a new and, and real and meaningful way. And uh, we're, we're thrilled. May you continue to do this uh, through the, his ministry and also through our lives here and send us out to do likewise. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being such a great and wonderful Savior. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you.